Welcome uh, to the Advisory Committee's uh, Transparencies event uh, entitled The Hidden Budget Tax Expenditures. I am thrilled to have uh, such an expert panel with us today and all of you here as well. Uh, this is the right time to be talking about the subject matter. Uh, from uh, beginning of the Appropriations Committee starting to think about budgets for 2012 with hearings already ongoing um, to reports being issued by multiple groups on tax expenditures. Uh, we seem to have hit a sweet spot in terms of interest in this topic and uh, uh, just really the right people to come and talk about it. So we are in, of course, a fiscal climate where every penny counts. And the equivalent of one quarter of this year's federal budget uh, went to tax breaks uh, that are often called tax expenditures to the tune of around $1 trillion. And of course, that number is a bit controversial, and I'm sure uh, our panelists will have uh, things to say about that. Uh, tax expenditures uh, are treated differently uh, when compared to other types of spending, such as through contracts and grants. Particularly, they're harder to track, they're subject to less congressional oversight, and they're caught up in conversations about definitions. So today's event uh, is hosted by the Advisory Committee on Transparency, of which I'm the director. And the Advisory Committee is an 18-member strong association of organizations from across the political spectrum that share ideas with members of Congress and their staff about transparency-related matters. Uh, the Advisory Committee itself is organized as a, product, uh, as a project of the Sunlight Foundation, and you can find more information at transparencycaucus.org. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, Representatives Daryl Issa and Mike Quigley, um, for uh, bringing us here and making uh, this series of discussions possible. So the format event, uh, today's event is in three parts. First, uh, we're gonna hear uh, opening remarks from our panelists. Uh, then we'll have a conversation up here a little bit, and then of course we will open up the conversation for questions from all of you. Uh, there's a sheet of paper on all of your chairs that uh, briefly describes uh, who's sitting up here with me, uh, and it also has a link to resources, uh, reports, uh, and other materials from uh, uh, the folks to my left and right. Um, feel free to check it out after, after today's event. And of course, if you're interested in learning more about the advisory committee, you can email act at sunlightfoundation.com or you can just simply grab me afterward. So I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. You can find out more about them on their website and on ours. Uh, starting uh, to my right, uh, we have Tom Hungerford, who is a specialist in public finance with the Congressional Research Service. He's also worked on these issues at GAO, OMB, and SSA, and there are probably other acronyms as well. Uh, he taught economics at Wayne State University, AU, and Johns Hopkins, and earned his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. And of course, he is here speaking on his own behalf and on behalf of CRS. Uh, next, um, we have uh, Jesse Feinberg, uh, who is speaking on uh, behalf of uh, Representative Quigley, who unfortunately was unable to attend today at the last moment, but we are thrilled to have Jesse here in his place. Uh, Jesse is in LA with Congressman Quigley. He's been there since June 2009, and his focus is on finance, budget, and tax policy. Uh, next, we have Lori Metcalf, who manages the Subsidy Sco Scope Project uh, for the Pew Charitable Trust. She's finishing her PhD at George Washington's uh, University's Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration and she's writing her dis dissertation on tax expenditures, so if you're looking for something good to read, uh, I understand it'll be coming out soon. <laughs> uh, immediately to my left is Eric Toder. Uh, an introduction of him would probably take the duration of, of our event, so I will simply say that he's an institute fellow at the Urban Institute. Uh, Dr. Toder has held a number of positions in tax policy offices in the U.S. government, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Analysis at Treasury, Director of Research at IRS, Deputy Assistant Director for Tax Analysis at CBO, and he earned his PhD in economics from the University of Rochester. And finally, all the way on my left is Bill Beach, the Director of the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation. In addition to having a good sense of humor, he also oversees Heritage's, Heritage's original statistical research on taxes, social security, energy crime, education, trade, and many more issues. Um, uh, we were also going to be joined by uh, Bob Carroll today, but at the last minute he was unable to join us. Uh, even so, we have a fantastic panel, uh, and with that I'm going to turn it over to Tom to give a couple of opening remarks. Okay. Uh, first thing is I just want to uh, reiterate what Daniel said is uh, anything I say are my views and not the views of uh, the Congressional Research Service. <clears throat> Actually, let me just start with the, uh, the official definition of tax expenditures, which, um, 
was uh, legislated in the uh, Congressional Budget and Empowerment Control Act of 1974, and tax expenditures are those revenue losses attributable to provisions of the federal tax laws which allow special exclusion, exemption, or deduction from gross income, or which provide a special credit, a preferential rate of tax, or a deferral of tax liability. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. And in the uh, five minutes that I have, I just want to make three points. Uh, point number one is there are requirements to evaluate tax expenditures for both Congress and the administration to evaluate uh, tax expenditures. But I, I would say that uh, at, at best you could say that there's been a general lack of enthusiasm for uh, performing these evaluations. And just to give a, a little bit of history, I, you know, basically the uh, idea of uh, tax expenditures and studying tax expenditures started in pretty much the 1950s. Uh, after the uh, passage of the Internal um, Revenue Code of 1954. Basically, before then, there was little interest in tax expenditures, especially before the Second World War, because so few, so few people were uh, affected by the income tax. I think about, uh, by 1939, uh, about 13% of families were actually paying and filing tax uh, in tax returns. Uh, though six years later, 84% of families were filing tax returns as uh, the income tax expanded uh, dramatically during the Second World War. So with the expansion of the uh, uh, income tax, Okay, tax expenditures became more important. And uh, people in the uh, Kennedy and Johnson administration and Treasury, and especially Assistant Secretary of, of Tax Policy, Stanley Surrey, were interested or realized that there was a huge subsidy program being administered or operated through the tax system. And uh, Professor uh, Surrey was interested in tax reform. Essentially, he wanted a broader tax base and, and lower but uh, progressive uh, tax rates, but he needed a tool to uh, illustrate the subsidy elements of the tax code, and that's where I think, uh, you know, basically tax expenditure analysis was born. Uh, but it was uh, six years after, uh, about five years after Johnson left office that we finally got something, uh, you know, uh, formal in legislation when the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when the uh, Congressional Budget and Empowerment Control Act of 74 uh, was passed. And that pretty much set up the situation we're in today. Tax expenditures were defined, and since then, the administration has been producing uh, an annual list uh, and estimated cost of tax expenditures. They now appear in, uh, as a chapter in analytical perspectives. The Joint Tax Committee also produces an annual list and estimated cost of, of uh, tax expenditures. And every two years, the Senate uh, Budget Committee puts out a compendium of, of tax expenditures, which uh, CRS uh, puts together, and this is what it looks like. It's available on their web website, and it's uh, good uh, bedtime reading. <laughs> so uh, download it and read it. And, uh, you know, though that's the current situation, there have been attempts over the years to actually uh, provide more analysis or evaluations of tax expenditures. And I'd say the first serious attempt came with uh, the, uh, with GEPRA, the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993. And even though, or what GEPRA does is it requires uh, agencies, the executive agencies, to prepare strategic, uh, strategic plans and also to uh, prepare annual performance plans and program uh, performance reports. Now, GEPRA does not mention tax expenditures anywhere. Okay? It uh, seems to be mostly on the spending side, but the uh, Senate uh, Committee on uh, Government Affairs in, uh, in the conference report uh, explicitly said they expected uh, OMB to undertake periodic uh, analyses of the effects of tax expenditures in achieving performance goals. Okay, the, in the executive branch, okay, most of the GEPRA requirements are implemented through the OMB Circular A11, which is you know, entitled the uh, Preparation Submit uh, excuse me, uh, Submission and Execution of the Budget. Okay, and it does explicitly state that uh, tax expenditures should be evaluated and uh, justified. And as um, 
uh, Len Berman, who was uh, also a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the uh, Clinton administration, uh, has described the, at least the Clinton administration as they were rather unenthusiastic about performing these evaluations. And from um, casual observation, I'd say subsequent administrations have been just as uh, unenthusiastic, and you could even go so far as to say uninterested in, in doing these evaluations. Now, just uh, at the end of the last Congress, we ended up with the, uh, the GEPRA Modernization Act, okay, which is to uh, kind of bring GEPRA up to date, and it explicitly mentions tax expenditures, uh, that tax expenditures should be uh, incorporated into the uh, required performance assessments, okay, and it was uh, finally signed into law in January of this year. Uh, now, I, I'd say it's, uh, it remains to be seen, it's a little too early to see what effect this will have on administration, uh, on the administration's uh, evaluations of tax expenditures, but I guess I'll go back to the, you know, what I said at the beginning is there seems to be a definite lack of enthusiasm to do uh, you know, serious analyses of tax expenditures. Second point I want to make is that there are over 200 tax expenditures, but few, but only a handful of tax expenditures account for most of the aggregate estimated revenue losses. And uh, I was just fooling around over the weekend with this. I came up with uh, 10 uh, tax expenditures, seven on the individual income tax side and three on the corporate side that account for half of the aggregate cost. So we're talking about $600 billion uh, or more a year. And then if you look at uh, the 10 largest individual tax expenditures and the 10 largest corporate, we're talking about 70% of the aggregate estimated uh, revenue losses. Okay? And so that leaves you know, well over 200, accounting for the other 30%. Okay? Now, the last point that I want to make is tax expenditures are in the tax code for a reason. Okay, it may be a good reason, it may be a bad reason, and different people are going to have their ideas of what's a good and bad reason uh, for these tax expenditures. And as a result, there's a constituency associated with each tax expenditure. So any attempts to eliminate or modify tax expenditures is going to be uh, politically difficult. Okay? You're going to have to deal with, uh, with these constituencies. And just to drive home the point, something that I think, uh, you know, just take three tax expenditures that everybody in this room uh, is affected by one of these and just think how you would feel if uh, these were modified. Okay, one is going to be the mortgage interest deduction. So every homeowner essentially is taking a tax deduction on that. Uh, for anybody who has employer provided health insurance, well, Okay, uh, employ the employer provided health insurance is excluded from <coughs> income calculations. And retirement plan contributions and earnings are also excluded from uh, the income tax. And you know, anybody who has a pension, probably most, most everybody in this room, and most everybody has uh, employer provided health insurance. Okay, how would you feel about having this, these three uh, deductions or exclusions modified. You probably would not be very happy. There's a definite uh, you know, constituency for each one of these. But I want to point out that these three, uh, these three tax expenditures account for about, you know, add up to about $300 billion a year. That's a quarter of uh, the projected uh, fiscal year 2011 uh, budget deficit. Uh, you know, so we're we're talking about uh, you know, something that is uh, real money uh, in dealing with tax expenditures. So I guess I Great. turn it over to Jeff. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, and by the way, for the folks who are standing, please feel encouraged. Uh, I don't mind if you sit behind me. Uh, so if there are chairs back there if you wish. Uh, but of course, you're welcome to stand by the door as well. Thank you, Tom, thank you. Jesse? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, for organizing this, and I'd, I'd like to say once again, I, I apologize that Congressman Quigley couldn't be here, but I'll do my best to, uh, you know, to, to say what he thinks, and uh, this is an issue he really cares about, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so recently, uh, there's been a lot of attention paid to tax expenditures, um, but like Tom has, you know, Tom has laid out the, the history of tax expenditures and how we've looked at them, and I think there's, you know, a strong case to be made that tax expenditures, uh, there have always been problematic tax expenditures. Uh, they make the tax code extremely complex. Uh, today they cost about a trillion, over a trillion per year, 
Um, that's obviously been increasing as tax expenditures have increased in number, uh, and they often don't serve the purpose for which they were originally intended. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why Congressman Quigley uh, got interested in tax expenditure transparency, uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the work that he's done, uh, including the Transparent and Sustainable Budget Act, which was a bill that we introduced last Congress and then uh, reintroduced about two months ago. Um, so I, I would argue that tax expenditures are more relevant uh, today than ever before because of our challenging fiscal outlook. And that's really why my boss became interested in tax expenditures. Uh, over the past few months, for example, we've seen this incredibly contentious budget debate uh, that almost shut down the government. Um, but that was only over the discretionary portion of the budget. Uh, so when I talk to people about this issue or when my boss talks to people about this issue, uh, he likes to ask, what's the government's most expensive housing program? And most people will talk about, or the first thing that comes to mind is something like uh, public housing funding that goes through HUD uh, that would come in the discretionary budget that, you know, that we debated about a couple months back. Uh, the entire Department of Housing and Urban Development, which includes that public housing funding, costs us about $50 billion per year. Uh, but housing tax expenditures dwarf that at, uh, I believe in fiscal year 2011, it was $221 billion. Uh, so that's many times the size of the discretionary housing programs that we traditionally associate with housing policy. Uh, so I would say there's clearly an oversight problem when tax expenditures, as we see in the case of housing, uh, dwarf their on-budget counterparts but aren't scrutinized in the same way as other spending programs that are explicitly laid out in the budget. Uh, one of the problems here is uh, the jurisdiction over tax expenditures, which is limited to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, even if in substance, those tax expenditures, housing, health care, et cetera, uh, have to do with other policy issues that may be you know, housed in the Energy and Commerce Committee or in other committees. Uh, many tax expenditures also exist in perpetuity, once written into the tax code, they effectively disappear from the public eye, uh, draining resources without any continuing oversight. Uh, those that are not permanent, which uh, there are several, uh, are regularly extended in an omnibus tax extenders bill, which regularly sails through Congress. Uh, so there's some clear oversight problems here. And even if members were inclined to, uh, to challenge whether these tax expenditures are worth it, uh, one thing that I have found in the time I've been here is that we often lack the data and the resources to do so. Um, I would say that there are some excellent resources out there. The Congressional Research Service provides uh, the book that Tom has just shown you uh, that contains explanations of the various tax expenditures. This is something that I use on a regular basis. Uh, Subsidy Scope as well is an excellent resource that I've used uh, doing a lot of research on tax expenditures. Um, but CRS can't editorialize um, and other agencies uh, well, have taken a pass on doing any substantive analysis. And what it really comes down to is that we don't have the data that we need, even if we are willing to editorialize about tax expenditures. Um, IRS collects this data, but it's not often made publicly available. Uh, and even when they do make it publicly available, it's not in uh, the right format. So the truth is that we really don't have the information we need to go after some of these most unnecessary tax expenditures. Since being sworn in two years ago, my boss has made tax expenditure oversight and transparency one of his top priorities in Congress. Uh, as I mentioned, he wrote the Transparent and Sustainable Budget Act, uh, which was introduced last Congress and then reintroduced this Congress uh, with, with uh, several other members on board. Uh, he's also issued two comprehensive budget reform reports uh, titled Reinventing Government, the Federal Budget. Uh, one of those makes recommendations uh, to cut multiple tax expenditures and do some other tax reform. Uh, the first one actually made several tax uh, recommendations to increase uh, tax expenditure oversight. And I'd briefly like to talk about those, uh, which were included in the bill I mentioned before, the Transparent Sustainable Budget Act. Uh, this bill would dramatically increase oversight of tax expenditures. Uh, it creates a point of order against consideration of tax expenditures unless they sunset within 10 years. Uh, this is not only to eliminate the mismatch between permanent tax expenditures and their temporary pay-fors, which often expire at the end of the budget window, uh, but it's also to provide a regular opportunity for members of Congress to reconsider whether a given tax expenditure is really worth it, uh, at least one opportunity every 10 years, perhaps less. Uh, Congressman Quigley's bill would also require the Department of Treasury 
to uh, issue regular performance reviews of tax expenditures at least every four years. Uh, and that has to do uh, with a lot of the, the effort that different agencies or members of Congress have made over, uh, over history to increase uh, the systematic review of tax expenditures, which Tom discussed earlier. Uh, this is critical not just because we need these reviews, but because Treasury has the data and the technical resources necessary to make this happen. The bill would also take steps towards requiring executive agencies to report on tax expenditures that relate to their mission area. Uh, the truth is, tax expenditures often spend more on a given policy area than the executive branch agency itself. We see this with HUD and housing policy. Uh, only by unifying oversight of these two buckets of spending can we achieve our policy goals at a reasonable cost. Uh, I, I would conclude by saying that uh, it, it comes down to the fact that we have immense fiscal challenges ahead. Just 10 years from now, in 2021, the interest we'll pay on our debt will cost taxpayers uh, $800 billion, according to the CBO. That's basically a new stimulus bill each year, just in interest payments. Obviously, this is totally unacceptable. Uh, we have to fix our budget. One thing that must change is weak oversight of tax expenditures. We've got to start thinking of them as spending programs in disguise and start giving them the same strong oversight that spending programs receive. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Worry? Thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for coming out this afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit more um, in depth about what government information on tax expenditures is currently available and the state of that data and a, a couple of the ways it could be improved. And then I'll share a little bit about what Pew is doing to compile some of this data and make it more accessible. Um, so as you've already heard, there are quite a few sources of government information out there on tax expenditures, but it's in many locations in different formats and that often don't lend themselves to data analysis. So at SubsidyScope, we're organizing that information, putting it all in one place on our website at subsidyscope.org, um, and where we're hoping users will search, filter, and download the information to do more with it themselves. So as Tom mentioned, the law requiring tax expenditure reporting directs both the executive and legislative branches to estimate and report federal income tax expenditures. So on the executive side, the Treasury does that and reports, uh, the OMB reports those estimates each year in the President's budget. And on the congressional side, of course, the Joint Committee on Taxation produces estimates for CBO. Both Treasury and JCT release their budgets annually. Uh, but they're released as PDFs instead of as database formats such as Excel, which would make them easier to work with. Um, these PDFs are only available online as far back as 1996. Um, and in 2011, OMB did begin posting online Excel tables for, for the Treasury estimates for the current budget year. So both Treasury and JCT present individual estimates of each tax expenditure grouped by budget function or which economic category they fall into. Each year, Treasury presents seven years of estimates, and this includes four years of projections out into the future, and JCT presents five years of estimates with two years out in, of projections. Uh, so both Treasury and JCT separate tax expenditure estimates by individuals and corporations, and then Treasury also offers a combined table. Um, at the end of its report, Treasury presents a listing of tax expenditures from largest to smallest, so you can easily get a sense of those with the largest revenue effect, which Tom was actually going through earlier. And more recent Treasury budgets do include a section on performance evaluation at the end, as well as the current administration's proposals regarding tax expenditures in the budget. Um, in the past years, there have been other items in the Treasury's tax expenditure budget, such as estimates under a consumption tax baseline and estimates under the estate and gift tax. So JCT provides a little bit more information about its estimation process in their budget. And at the end of its reports, there are distributional tables for tax expenditures that have the largest um, estimated revenue loss. And these tables allow us to see how many people in each income group take advantage of a particular tax expenditure, as well as how the revenue loss is distributed across income group. So for example, such a pr presentation allows us to see that according to JCT in 2009, the majority of those benefiting from the mortgage interest deduction made over $100,000 a year, while the majority of those taking the earned income tax credit made less than $30,000 a year. So this type of distributional information is key for getting the full picture of who's using and benefiting from the tax expenditures. So in addition to some of the difficulty with using the data, there isn't a lot of transparency about how accurate the estimations are. We know that these estimates are all based on tax returns from prior years, 
and they also include various economic assumptions. But to my knowledge, neither Treasury nor JCT publicly releases any analysis of how close those pro projections are to reality. And such an exercise would improve the accuracy of the estimations and also transparency about the estimation process. And as Tom mentioned, the uh, CRS compendium is another very useful document that's put out every couple of years. And it has, it's just a great resource for more in-depth information on the specific tax expenditures. And then I think Jesse also mentioned that the IRS does provide more, um, more in-depth information through its statistics of income division um, for people who are really interested in getting into the specific data sets and doing more sophisticated analysis. Um, so while there are all these data sources, it's safe to say there's quite a bit of information, but it's spread out across different agencies and it's not very easy to use if you're just trying to get a basic, basic understanding of tax expenditures and some basic information. So that's where Pew's Subsidy Scope project comes in. Subsidy Scope's mission is to raise awareness about subsidies in the economy. And to do that, we organize and compile um, data on government spending and subsidies by economic sector. In addition to looking at information by sector, we look at grants, contracts, loans and loan guarantees, and tax expenditures to get a sense of the different tools government is using um, to deliver these subsidies. So we're nonpartisan and we make no recommendations, but we think that policymakers should have the best possible data available and we think the public should also be able to understand how government is subsidizing various economic activities. So with our technical partners at the Sunlight Foundation, we are working to make government data easier to use and understand. And one of the projects that we've been working on um, for almost a year now is a database of all federal income tax expenditures. So we've been compiling over 10 years worth of Treasury and JCT tax expenditure budgets and organizing it into a database where for the first time you can look at Treasury and JCT estimates next to each other where they match up. And you can also see changes over time in the estimations and aggregated by sector for order of magnitude estimates for the groups of tax expenditures. So we've actually already released three sectors of data um, at our website for housing, energy, and transportation. And you can find that at subsidyscope.org. And we will be releasing the full set of data um, for all federal tax expenditures um, within the next month. So we hope you'll use that if you want to compare tax expenditures to each other or across sector or over time. And with that, I'll right. turn it over. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Eric? OK, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm also speaking for myself and not for any um, past or current employer. Um, what I'm going to say is probably going to have a lot of overlap with it with the previous three speakers, except I'll, I'll give a s probably somewhat little different spin. So um, I've got uh, three points I want to make, and I'll elaborate. One, uh, tax expenditures are not loopholes. Um, two, most tax expenditures should be viewed as adding to instead of reducing the size of government, and that's a very important aspect of how we view them. But many are not in that category, and, and that's a difficult judgment call where to put it. Um, Third has to do with the distribution. Um, tax expenditures are seen by many as favoring the rich, and, and we have some calculations that show that. But actually, um, really, the, the bottom line answer to that question is what you assume uh, would have been done with the money if we didn't have the tax expenditures. And that turns out to drive the, the answer. Um, OK, so the first point, uh, they're not loopholes. That should seem to be obvious based on Tom's presentation about how much comes from big and, and popular uh, spending. And I, I kind of only mention this point because um, they're, they've been called loopholes and earmarks by groups like the, the Bowles Simpson Commission. And I, I think it's un understandable why they want to put it that way because it puts them in a negative light. But it also kind of fools us into thinking that they're these provisions that are snuck into the code in the dark of the night by some lobbyists. I mean, some of them are in that nature, but the biggest ones are, are very big and popular provisions that many people use. Uh, for example, in 2008, uh, 39 million taxpayers claimed home mortgage interest deduction. Uh, 39 million claimed uh, charitable. Uh, 35 million deducted state and local taxes. And I'm sure the number that benefited from the uh, exclusion for health insurance was was uh, substantially uh, bigger. There are very important reasons, or arguments for eliminating some of these tax expenditures and for paring back others. And it's very important that tax expenditures be on the table in any a deficit reduction uh, effort. But I just, again, caution, don't 
don't think this is going to be easy. That's the message Tom gave as well. Um, the second thing is a question of kind of are you looking at, I guess the whole word tax expenditures is used because we kind of think these are hidden spending items and they're not uh, tax cuts. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the way tax expenditures are calculated are as exceptions to some hypothetical alternative tax system. So they're, they're heavily dependent on what you say that hypothetical tax system uh, is. Now I can give examples of th some things that clearly uh, would be uh, spending substitutes, for example, the ex exemption of health insurance premiums or things like energy tax subsidies, um, uh, whether they're tax credits for renewable energy or oil and gas preferences such as um, percentage depletion or things like tuition tax credits. Nobody would, uh, that I know, would think any of these provisions would be part of some normative broad-based uh, uh, tax system which tax piece, taxes people based on ability to, to pay. They can only be thought of as provisions that are uh, trying to do what spending programs do and encourage uh, certain kinds of behavior or help certain kinds of taxpayers. Um, however, there are other examples which you might call structural provisions of the tax code. For example, a big item in the corporate area is the deferral of tax on income from controlled foreign corporations. Um, th that says the norm is we would tax all uh, U.S. corporations immediately on their worldwide income. It happens that no other country in the world does that. So. While that might be a good normative rule, it's a little hard to think of that as, a, as an analog to a spending program. Uh, similarly with preferences for capital gains. I mean, you could say they're good, good or they're bad, but it's hard to think of what the spending program is that those things are, 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 are replacing. Um, so uh, along with my colleague uh, Donald Marin, we've been engaging in this exercise to try to classify the tax expenditures and, and see which ones fit in one bucket in an effort to try to figure out how we really should measure the size of government. That's not only relevant for historical purposes, but also for trying to understand what all these uh, deficit reduction programs like um, the um, Bipartisan Policy Center, the Bowles Simpson provisions are really doing. How much are they cutting spending and how much are they increasing taxes? Well, things that look like revenue increases not maybe should be viewed as spending cuts if they're cutting uh, tax expenditures. Um, so our calculations were roughly 65% uh, of the dollar value of tax expenditures represented programs that could have been spending programs and maybe 35% are just provisions that are um, maybe a defective rule in the tax code. Um, of those 65%, about half, 50% of those affect resource allocation, that is kind of what kinds of activities people undertake, what, what's produced in the economy, and maybe the other 14 percent or so substitute for transfer programs. That is, there are ways of, of putting money in certain people's pockets, but they're not necessarily affecting resource allocation. I would put the earned income credit in, in kind of in more in that category. Um, so um, then there's also the question somebody mentioned that, you know, is the normative tax base income or consumption, and I won't say what it should be, but there are obviously some tax expenditures like preferences for retirement saving, which would not be tax expenditures if our normal normative tax rule were a consumption base instead of an income tax base. And again, roughly 70 percent by our calculations are tax expenditures against both an income and a consumption base. So most, a very large proportion of these things are, are really spending substitutes no matter how you look at it. Okay, so the third point has to do with a, a distribution. And uh, we've also done some calculations at the Tax Policy Center. Uh, the one thing that we've done that the Joint Committee hasn't done is we've aggregated the tax expenditures and, and calculated the effects of them simultaneously. So that takes into effect the interactions among various uh, provisions. The estimating agencies, for whatever reason, don't do that. Um, and so what we found for example, is that the, uh, and this is using the traditional uh, definition of tax expenditures and just for individuals, that the top fifth of the population gets about 66% uh, of the tax expenditures under current law. That top fifth um, has about 55% of the income. So the tax expenditures are, are distributed disproportionately uh, with respect to income. 
uh, the top 1% gets 25% of benefits and 18% and of pre-tax income. However, if you look at things relative to the share of taxes they pay, you get kind of a different answer. And that's, of course, because we have a progressive tax system, so uh, people who are high up the income distribution also pay higher taxes as a, as a share of, of their income, as well as receiving higher tax benefits as a share of their, 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 their income. So the question really then is, what if you got rid of tax expenditures? Uh, would the tax system be more progressive or less progressive? And it really uh, depends on what you do with that money. So if you were to, to give it back as a, a flat rate tax, as, as a flat rate cut as a percentage of income, you'd be making the tax system uh, more progressive. If you were to give it back as a proportional cut in all rates, everyone gets an equal percentage rate, you'd probably make it a little bit less progressive, and particularly at the bottom, because the low-income people would lose the earned income credit and the child credit, and they wouldn't get any benefit from the tax rate cuts. Uh, if you gave um, it back as a po in instead by increasing spending programs that uh, are, for sake of argument, worth the same per capita for everybody, then you'd make the system much more progressive. So I guess partly what I'm arguing is you've got to really look at these things not just in isolation, but what they're doing as part of the entire tax system. And if you are eliminating them, what are you substituting um, uh, for them? I should make the point in 1986, the elimination of tax expenditures really was overwhelmingly directed at people in the high income groups, but they were also the people who got the largest tax rate cuts, so the, the, the distributional effects were about neutral. Okay, I will close. Thank you so much, Eric. Bill? Uh, yes, uh, thank, thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, before I be begin, I would just sort of sum up the, I'm the, I'm the cleanup better, I, I suppose. Uh, I do recommend to you Lori's uh, subsidy scope project is an extraordinary place to ease your data needs. And uh, the project that uh, Aaron, uh, Eric and um, Donald Marin are engaged in is uh, one of the most promising projects in tax expenditure work that I've seen since being in, in Washington for ne nearly 20 years. Uh, uh, many in Washington policymaking community have really become exceptionally interested in tax expenditures as a potential source of additional revenue during this time of acute fiscal challenge. E evidence of this is just all around us. It's found in even the most common places, uh, even on Fox News. Uh, uh, others take a more sophisticated view that focusing on tax expenditures will shed light on all of the private economic and social activities that the government supports through the tax code. It's the second reason I think that a lot of folks are interested in tax expenditures. This focus presumably will help policymakers design programs that more efficiently achieve such goals as, say, stronger economic growth and more cohesive families. Uh, even fewer uh, see the current focus as a most welcome opening to advance fundamental tax reform. Uh, our tax code needs to be fundamentally reformed at least once every generation. Uh, I think once a year would be good, but once every generation is probably what we can do. Uh, just to clean out the many special provisions that few policymakers know about and fewer still would support. Uh, I count myself in this group that welcomes this focus for its tax reforming potential. Uh, the case against the current tax code is, of course, well known. Business and individual incomes are often taxed multiple times. Complexity sends even seasoned tax pros into feverish outrage. And well-intended tax breaks often uh, put taxpayers into the AMT, for example, or have economic and social consequences quite the opposite of what policymakers envisioned. Uh, so uh, let me shed some light on all of this discussion, and, and we'll go down first by looking at some of the unseen parts of tax expenditures. Uh, Daniel said, keep your comments on transparency. So I'm doing almost the opposite, but for just a moment, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. Uh, less noted is the increasing injustice of the tax code produced by the way in which tax subsidies phase in and out as income changes. And so I've, I've put on your chair this graphic. A uh, little history, I uh, was asked to testify in, at the uh, tax reform panel, which uh, sat in 2005, Fundamental Tax Reform Panel, on tax justice. And so w one of the things that, uh, that um, Kevin Hassett and I thought we would do to make it clear whether justice exists is to take a look at a family of four in terms of the 1986, 1988, and 2004 tax changes. Um, 
when we finished this, we showed it to Roseanne Altshuler, who was the technical economist for that thing, and she sent it, unbeknownst to us, to a friend of hers in Paris, who painted a picture of the of the line, and that's what's on the back. I think the 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 painting of the tax expenditure buildings was what actually caught the panel's attention more than the graphics in in front. Now I kind of regret that, uh, but I think y'all will be able to follow the numbers. Uh, Eric mentioned just a moment ago how how important it is that we follow tax expenditures against against some kind of a norm. I mean, how are you going to tell a tax expenditure unless you have some sort of norm to compare it against? While this isn't intended to do this, let me just point out that the dotted line was, was the effective marginal tax rates for a family of four in 1986 as we move across income. And note that even though it's bumpy in, in places, indicating the presence or the absence there of subsidies, uh, it nevertheless looks fairly progressive, doesn't it? It's got a nice upward movement to it. In, 2000, in 1988, uh, Congress decided to perfect the 1986 uh, Tax uh, Act, and they began to put into it more and more social and economic subsidies. And now you can see that sort of the, the faded dark, darker line is jumping all around. When it rises above that dotted line, it's sort of like a surcharge. When it falls below that line, it certainly could be an expenditure or some kind of a subsidy. And then look at 2004. By, by, by the time we get to 2004, I mean, this thing is becoming chaotic. I, I wish I had updated this uh, chart, uh, Daniel, for today's because it would be all over the line, I can assure you. Creating a more just tax code, however, requires that we have an ideal tax code in mind, something that becomes the goal of tax reform. If we had such an ideal tax code in front of us, we also could more easily define what is and what is not a tax expenditure or a departure from this normal or ideal tax system. So it's just not a matter of identify, identifying the tax expenditures. You need to know what kind of a tax system is the ideal system that you're working with. Just because Congress has provided a taxpayer with a credit or deduction does not necessarily mean that you're looking at a tax expenditure, unless you think about the credit or deduction in terms of an ideal or normal tax system. Let me just give you some pushback on the mortgage interest deduction. Many think that the deduction for home mortgage interest is an absolutely perfect tax expenditure, which in my view it certainly is not. Uh, this deduction reflects the good and widely accepted tax policy of taxing interest on the receiver's end if it is deducted by the payer. So it's a wash. The actual tax expenditure is the untaxed imputed rent. Congress does not tax the rental income of taxpayers who rent out their houses, doesn't, it, it, it does tax, excuse me, the rental income of taxpayers who rent out their houses, but does not tax the imputed rent that taxpayers who live in their houses could be paying to themselves. And so there we have a much bigger tax expenditure and an absolutely uncontroversial one. It sounds very easy to determine the ideal tax system, but a moment's reflection tells you how hard this really is. My ideal system is the consumed income tax system with a flat rate. Others would, would back a progressive t a rate system that taxes a, a, a consumption and passive income. Uh, both are ideal systems in which tax expenditures look very different. Uh, finally, there's the remarkable view uh, that we easily can quantify the revenue we would gain if these tax expenditures became taxable. No problem. Uh, while relatively minor tax subsidies, certain deductions and credits, can be directly estimated, taxing the big ones almost always involves behavioral responses that can seriously affect the static revenue estimate. Let me give you just two and then I'll conclude. Estate taxes. Uh, currently, the tax basis of an asset in an estate tax return is not the original amount the taxpayer paid for it, paid for that asset but rather the value of the asset at the taxpayer's death. The basis is stepped up at death. Because of step up, there is no capital gains tax due, which would be the tax due on the difference between the original basis and the basis when the asset was transferred or sold. The Treasury Department currently counts the foregone cap gains tax as a tax expenditure because we have an estate tax. We don't tax the cap gains. Presumably, if estate taxes were repealed, we would get tens of billions of dollars in cap gains revenue. And a lot of people think that would be the case. 
However, the Joint Committee on Taxation staff will throw up their hands and point out that cap gains tax is a voluntary tax. It is paid when a taxpayer decides to sell the asset, which makes it all but impossible to determine when the revenues will be coming in. Secondly, deduction for employer-provided health insurance. Many analysts believe this is the largest tax expenditure out there, one of the largest. Uh, currently, employers may deduct the cost of providing health insurance to employees, but employees are not taxed on the value of this insurance, which likely other otherwise would be higher wages and salaries, where they would be taxed. Some argue that ending the deduction or taxing the benefit would yield hundreds of billions in revenues. That revenue windfall assumes, of course, that neither the employer nor the employee would change their behavior once taxes were assessed on health insurance. It also assumes the cost of health insurance, which is now heavily subsidized through the tax code, would remain the same after the policy change. Thank you. Great, thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists. So what's going to happen now is we're going to have uh, a brief conversation up here, and uh, after that, uh, we will be encouraging and inviting your questions and comments. So I actually uh, have a couple of questions that have come from, from the presentations today. Um, sort of building a little bit off of, you know, Eric, you had identified that maybe two-thirds of tax expenditures are spending substitutes. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if we were to treat those tax expenditures as a spending substitute? How would that change the process? Would outcomes be different in terms of where money is allocated? How, do, you know, how would that change things, basically? And anybody's welcome to, to jump in on that. Or would it make no difference? Well, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're in, a, in a state of flux as far as budget processes are concerned. So you could say how it might have affected things 20 years ago when we actually had uh, spending caps and, and pay go that was relatively effective for, for a period of, of time. So, it, you know, it's, it's very, very hard to say right. what, what sort of rules Congress is going to, to set up. However, one thing, it, it would be a mistake to say that tax expenditures were uncontrolled in, in those days. I mean, I worked in the Clinton administration and people always wanted new tax expenditures and there was always a pushback from Treasury that's saying well, this is going to cost too much money. And, and, but the question was when you looked at a tax expenditure, you weren't saying I'm going to cut some direct spending to, to, to pay for this. You would say, well, the way to, to, to um, cut a tax expenditure or the way to pay for a new tax expenditure would be to either uh, cut some mandatory spending or to, to um, raise revenue in another way. Favorite way in those days was to find some loophole, a uh, corporate loophole to close or some unintended provision that Wall Street was taking advantage of or, or some compliance provision and, and you could get a few billion dollars and then have a new tax expenditure. But um, I think, you know, one of the things that's happened actually internationally with trying to tax expenditure control is they've not been effective in integrating spending programmatic programs that are both tax and spending. Mm -hmm. And I so, so I think it, I'm, I'm not sure in terms of overall budget control that you're better or worse off by trading the tax expenditures off against revenues and entitlements versus discretionary spending. But I think from a logical programmatic point of view, if you could do that, it would in some way in terms of having, for example, the, the budget for the housing and urban development include the mortgage interest deduction or imputed rent, if you want to define it that way, whatever, you, however you want to do it, um, or in the energy department. And then if you were got people thinking in terms of how much we're spending on these various budget functions, then I think that might force some um, harder thinking about whether these tax expenditures are more desirable in, than other ways of spending the money. Okay. And, and thank you. And that sort of leads me actually to, to ask the same question in a slightly different way to Jesse, mm -hmm. which is that, um, you know, Regular spending programs go through appropriators, they go through authorizers, they go through this, this you know, significant process by which they're reviewed on a regular basis. Uh, in your comments, you talked about sunset provisions, you talked about ways of forcing it back uh, for Congress to deal with it. Could you talk about the extent to which Congress is able to pay attention to these things now when they're trying to uh, set budget priorities for the upcoming year, to the extent, of course, that Congress can set budget priorities for any year? So. Sure. Um, Actually, really glad you asked that. That was uh, I was just about to jump in on that last question as well. 
Um, when we were working on the Transparent Sustainable Budget Act um, last, last year, um, one of the goals was to find some way to integrate the appropriations process with tax expenditures, um, which proved to be much more difficult than I had expected, even though I expected it to be quite difficult. Uh, I think one of the big challenges is that tax expenditures, uh, for the most part, are open-ended in commitments, which means that you know, even if you project them to you know, cost, or however you want to phrase it, say $10 billion, if a lot of taxpayers claim that deduction or you know, if corporations take advantage of it, it can go much higher. So there's really no way to cap, well, I mean, I, I suppose you could cap a tax expenditure, but in the context of the appropriations process, there's not a way to integrate those into it in the sense that appropriations are appropriated to a dollar amount. Um, but I, I think it's extremely important because when you have something like housing policy that you're trying to prioritize, and obviously when uh, the T-HUD appropriations bill goes through, there you know, is usually a top dollar amount, and then you allocate dollars between competing priorities. In an ideal world, things like, uh, well, like any of the housing tax expenditures that add up to that $221 billion figure, those priorities, what the, the policy ends they're achieving would be weighed against the ones that we appropriate, and they would compete for resources. But I, I think logistically, it's extremely difficult. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this question? I, I, I wonder whether or not uh, tax expenditures would fit better under an entitlement budget. Could you I explain? Mean, be, well, because it, they are open-ended. I mean, it, if you qualify, you get. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no cap on it. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, uh, you know, what are we doing? Maybe, maybe, maybe one way to think about it is that this is part of the entitlement problem. And, and uh, what, what, what would prevent a tax rule that says only the first 40,000 taxpayers would get the mortgage interest deduction? I'm, 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 I'm being, I'm being uh, a little bit aggressive. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think it's you know, certainly a fair point that tax expenditures have a lot in common with entitlement programs and that you know, once they're passed, they, they exist, and Congress doesn't really exercise uh, an immense amount of oversight over them going forward. Um, but I, you know, I'd be curious to... Uh, I think, again, it, the logistics are difficult. Of course, there are some tax expenditures that are not entitlement programs, things like the low-income housing credit, which are, right. are, are capped, or some of the energy. Uh, or regularly extended. Yeah, they're regularly expended. That's another issue, whether they're right. expended, but they're, but they're budgeted. In, in, uh, so, and, that's, and that's actually another question, which um, the, the tax extenders, you know, where they're – part of this goes into the way Congress uh, – uh, engages in the budget process generally, but when you have um, uh, provisions that are put in, you know, year by year, it seems like those are different in kind um, than tax expenditures that are that sort of, uh, you know, there's there's a, a saying that the only thing that's true is death and taxes, but uh, uh, tax expenditures oftentimes are deathless, uh, and that and that may be, uh, you know, in this case as well. So, are th when you look at things like uh, tax extenders, is that more along the lines of sh what's a good conceptual frame? Like, what's a good way to think of that? Is it is it like a, almost like an earmark for taxes? Is it something that if it's renewed time after time after time, that should almost be thought of as a regular tax expenditure? What's the best way to think about uh, these kinds of things, oh, Tom? I mean, I think personally, I think they just should be considered a tax expenditure because I think that I just had mentioned this is tax extent. The tax extenders are usually just I mean, they're put out there as a, you know, basically a package, and there's very little discussion uh, about them. And, uh, you know, I mean, the Senate may have, uh, you know, some different ideas than the House about, you know, what should be included in this package, but uh, there seems to be very little debate uh, going on uh, about those, and, and actually no study. And just to la take last year's uh, extenders uh, legislation, I think in the, uh, in the House version that passed in uh, the end of uh, 2009, uh, there was a little provision in there that said the tax uh, extenders uh, that are tax expenditures should be studied by uh, JCT and GAO. Okay, it goes over to the Senate. Okay, there's a Senate amendment and basically replace the whole bill uh, with their list of tax extenders, but there's no study. It goes back to the House. There's a House amendment to the Senate amendment. 
uh, and you know, slightly different lists and some other things added, and the study is back in. Then everything is stripped out. It becomes an unemployment uh, insurance reauthorization bill, and that, that passes. Uh, and then uh, it, you know, kind of it's floating out there, and then at the, uh, in the lame duck session last December, the tax extenders uh, finally passed, and there was you know, <laughs> no discussion of that. All the discussion was on the Bush tax cuts. And that passed, and there's no study in there. And uh, you know, one, I think that was unfortunate that the study wasn't in there, but I think it would have been fortunate uh, if, if the study had been done before the legislation was considered. You know, that, that, that uh, tax extenders question is great because it does raise a point that I, I think Eric raised just in passing. Uh, the, the research and experimentation credit, what some people call the R&D credit, may be a very desirable property to have in the tax code because it, 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 it reflects um, what might be a normal business tax of allowing for these research and development or experimentation costs to be deducted from the cost of, do, of, of doing business. So rather than a, an expenditure, that might be treated or seen as a structural part of our tax code. I'm just raising I'm not arguing that that's, that's the case. But you're talking about expensing, not the, not the credit. Right, well, the expensing, right, just take, taking, taking that out. And, but there are other parts like in the extenders, like uh, the RUM uh, credit for Puerto Rico and other, other things. I don't know if there's any advocates for that in the room, and I don't mean to offend, but um, uh, that, that are, are just without doubt uh, operating as a subsidy. So, so we have to be careful not to glump everything that's going through on the extenders bill in as necessarily of the same classification. Okay. Uh, I think I have one more question and then I'm going to encourage the audience, uh, if you have questions as well, uh, to, to be ready to ask them. Uh, so there's sort of a political reality around tax expenditures. A lot of the framing of this discussion is that um, their tax cuts. You know, the politicians talk about um, reducing the size of government. Although, Eric, you were talking a bit about how um, maybe that's not the right way to think about the size of government, that tax, expend tax uh, expenditures actually are yet another piece of the cost of doing business. Um, given that framework, given that um, uh, tax expenditures and tax cuts are so often thought of in the same breath, and this may not be the right folks to ask, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Is there a way that we can talk about these issues uh, that uh, will illuminate uh, as opposed to obfuscate, that will help, that will help bring forward um, you know, where government is spending so that people can make decisions about whether the spending is, is something that they would support or not? Have I managed to get everybody to be quiet? Your program. Okay. Well, I thought I would ask it anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You want I to take a shot? Um, yeah. I would just throw out the one, one thing that Subsidy Scope is doing, as I mentioned, is um, grouping uh, contracts, grants, loan guarantees, and tax expenditures by category. So that one way to help illuminate what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't speak to the political realities of it, of but um, you can, for example, go to our website and look at all the spending in the housing sector in one place. So I think we're trying to make you know the data available if people want to look into that. and. Um, see where, where things are going and, you know, okay. speak to that well, issue. You know, I guess I'd say one thing that's really extraordinary about what's happened in the last uh, two or three years is mm -hmm. the increased consensus view that many of these uh, uh, provisions really are spending provisions. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be, um, I hope I'm not offending Bill, if I talk to my friends in the conservative movement and I use the word tax expenditure, they would look at yeah, me we, like we it was would, a... We would be agreeing. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but... Uh, but um, they seem to have, there seems to have been a, a, a different a change in viewpoint, and I think that's, that's very, uh, a very positive sign. Well, you know, that, let, let me just say one thing about the, uh, the right of center on this issue and, and what happens to the Coburn bill in the Senate, I guess, today or tomorrow on the ethanol tax credit is, is huge on this issue. There was a view that eliminations of a tax, of a tax expenditure, any credit deduction, no matter how obnoxious it was, would cause taxes to rise. And there are hundreds of people in this, for better or for worse, mem members who have signed a pledge through Grover Norquist that that, that would never happen. Uh, I think that's, uh, if I could just say personally, I think that's a very close-minded view on how to reform a tax code that you can never have, you can never clean out what's wrong. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how the Senate handles this. 
because the Republicans certainly have to develop a language for doing tax reform that allows them to go forward and eliminate what's wrong in the code. There's, there's, really, there's really no question about that. Um, and uh, we'll see. I mean, there's very good things that, that the Norquist pledge has, has, has put in place, and it's uh, stopped, I think, a number of bad taxes. But on the other hand, we're at a crucial point in our fiscal history where it may be important for uh, people like Coburn and DeMint uh, to, to lead to a language that allows for tax reform to happen. Great. And with that, uh, okay, uh, some questions. And we have a microphone coming around. Can you make sure that it's – oh, you're going to turn it on. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of one additional point as well. So uh, Eric had mentioned uh, – Actually, Tom had mentioned that there were a couple of tax expenditures that, of course, amounted for the vast majority of, of the fiscal cost. But there's also hundreds of other tax expenditures that, you know, can be the result of, that benefit one or a few entities as well, I would assume, uh, and that it's sort of the, uh, the gold mine for certain types of lobbying, whereas if you get this, you know, it's not like you got a particular spending provision one year into the, uh, into the budget, rather, you've got something that uh, you know, it's it's just a wellspring. It, it, pardon? It just keeps giving. It, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and with that, we'll start over here. Thanks, Dan, for a fabulous program. They said Garcia Judicial Watch. Of course, my remarks are, are my own and not uh, those of the organization. I hate to sound like a caveman, but that's exactly what I was thinking, is that there seems to be an underlying assumption under many of the panelists' uh, views and remarks that the money belongs to the government at bottom and that these are sort of uncaptured royalties out floating like dandelion seeds. And, um, and I'm just kind of concerned by that. Um, not all of them, but some of them, you know, a bulk of them. And, and, and it is uh, people's money that they earned. And I'm not sure that it's fair to um, start out with the premise that redistribution to people who haven't earned it, it's like an earned income tax credit. It's actually earned income by other people. So, so that's tough to, to swallow. But actually, my question it more relates to definitions. I appreciated the starting out with the define, defining the expenditure as a premise or as a concept. Um, but progressive was also used, and do you mean by that, um, Dr. Toder, particularly, um, like steeper, just to be on the same page, steeper or more even, or w it, when we spoke about more progressive, less progressive, I wasn't exactly okay. sure. Okay, so that, used, that term is used, you know, policy-based. Okay, so, so the, the way that term is usually used is a, a progressive tax system would be one in which the average tax rate that people pay rises as their income rises, and so if you, you know, if you pay. 20% uh, of your income at all, at all income levels, that would be considered proportional. If you pay 20% at 50,000 and 30% at 100,000, that would be progressive or going the other way, it's regressive. So it just has to do with the steepness of the, of the uh, ratio, relationship of, of, of average tax rate to income. And in, in those calculations, it refers to all, all tax provisions, including those that, that, that are defined as tax expenditures. Sir, in the front? Just uh, one moment, wait for the mic. Yeah, uh, Congressman Quigley uh, has a report uh, recommending uh, the elimination of some of the more pernicious uh, tax expenditures. Uh, but it's basically a uh, bottom-up, uh, the conventional approach uh, to dealing with the uh, problem. There is an alternative approach that's a conceptual possibility, and during a time of uh, fundamental budgetary uh, uh, reconsideration perhaps uh, should be considered, and that is uh, adopting a resolution eliminating all tax expenditures 100 percent in 12 months, subject uh, to the adoption by Congress by individual uh, roll call votes, uh, specific uh, tax expenditure uh, provisions with due consideration uh, for uh, phase out and, uh, and limitations. Uh, this would uh, shift uh, the, uh, the burden of consideration. Uh, Congressmen would have to vote uh, whether to retain the things, and if so, uh, whether to modify them, and cause them to consciously deliberate on whether specific provisions make any sense. It would also uh, mobilize the uh, congressional uh, staff uh, resources uh, to, uh, to mark up that, uh, that bill. So let me turn that into a question, uh, which is uh, phase out, uh, whether it's 12 months or, or five years or 10 years, um, people have come to rely upon the tax code in the way that it's structured. Um, if we want to go, as the gentleman in the front row suggested, where all tax expenditures are eliminated or the vast majority are eliminated, and then, you know, with the exception of a few brought back, 
how do you make that transition? How do you transition from the system that we have to to the kind of system where where these decisions aren't made through the tax code? Uh, is there anyone who wants to? Yeah. Well, I could just start to we because we've actually proposed that uh, in earlier. I guess it was in in May. Are we in May now? We're we're in June. Uh, early, earlier in May, uh, we have a we have eliminated all the tax expenditures in the code. We go to a consumed income tax. This is in a, a publication called Saving the American Dream, where we, with a number of other groups, uh, under a grant from the Peterson Institute in New York, developed the uh, these budgets, and uh, we we grandfather in a lot of activity. So you know we don't have to worry about transition costs quite as much. There is a transition period. And then we, we bring back uh, uh, two or three of the more popular ones just so that our, our proposal is not drowned out. Now, on paper, it works out pre pretty well. I mean, we didn't have to deal with the politics of 10,000 lobbyists coming into the, into the halls here and, and, and making life miserable for everyone. But I would think, given the experiences we've had from time to time of fundamentally changing our, our tax system, that it could be done. And oftentimes, these cold water, uh, do it all at once things is, are, are the best way of doing it. That way, everybody's sort of treated on an equal basis. If I may. Yeah, of course. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, I mean, obviously the, the best example for that is 1986. And um, I, I certainly think that, you know, going after more than just the few, right, not the few, but you know, the, the set of tax expenditures that we discuss in our report is, uh, I mean, is a good idea. Uh, and we do discuss at length the approach of eliminating many more tax expenditures. Um, Recognizing, of course, that I in some cases the tax code may be the best way to deliver a particular benefit, or recognizing the difficulty of sometimes uh, picking which are tax expenditures and which should be a part of the normal tax code. Um, I, I think that if you were to do that, you would have to look at it as uh, an opportunity to not only uh, simplify the tax code, uh, but also to um, well, to contribute to deficit reduction and to a lowering of rates across the board. Um, I, I think all of those options would have to be on the table. So, okay, I, I guess I have a couple of comments on that. I, I, I think there's a little bit of misreading of the 1986 history. It, it did not eliminate all tax expenditures. In fact, most tax expenditures that the middle class relied on were retained in 1986, including health care, uh, mortgage interest, state and local, charitable, uh, just a whole host of things. They were only nicked a little bit or, or, or totally retained. The big things that they went after were tax shelters and capital gains and, and uh, corporate loopholes and the investment credit, and, and that's why the rates were lowered at the high end. So it was, it was really more a business and investment income and not, not a whole lot of, a few individual provisions, state and local sales tax. but. But not really a lot was 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 done in, in that in that uh, in that uh, vein in 1986. Now we've got a lot more individual tax expenditures now, so there's probably more more out there that could be could be addressed. But I think if we're really talking about these provisions as as spending, um, I, I'm all for Bill's idea of, of if you want to do something, do something big because you, you want got to have something to show for it. But if, if you're thinking of these things as, as, as spending, uh, I don't think, uh, you, you just ask the question, would you say um, we should just uh, eliminate all uh, expenditures and, and then start from zero with expenditures? I don't know that, that anybody's really saying that. Now, you might turn around and say, well, for appropriations, you really do that because you have to appropriate everything every year. And well, we see how that works out. You know, you, you end up with without a budget, and then you pass a continuing resolution. Everything gets 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 passed. So, I, I could imagine a sunset of all tax expenditures. You get to December, and Congress say, "Oh my God, let's uh, let's put that push this back six months, or push this back a year." And I, I I just don't think you can really avoid kind of looking at the provision by provision and saying we want to have this thing this thing's out outlived its usefulness, and it's hard, but. But and just following up on what, what Eric said, I, I mean, I think they would, what may end up happening if we were to go to something like that is Congress may end up doing what they do with, uh, you know, basically the current budget. We take last year's budget and then fiddle around with it and 
you know, I could see the same thing happening with uh, with tax extend. Uh, you know, if you took all tax expenditures and they had to be extended uh, another year, maybe let's just start with the ones we have, fiddle around here at the edges, and then just pass the thing in mass uh, with maybe, you know, quite possibly relatively little thought by many in Congress, the committees who are uh, responsible maybe to consider, uh, look at things in more detail, but, uh, you know, I just don't see that there'd be a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, if we Seem, were we might have a model at the state levels, uh, since uh, m maybe I'll turn to worry on this. Um, sure. Well, I was just thinking through this discussion that, I mean, this sort of leads to what Tom was mentioning at the beginning, which is you know, more evaluation, which is sort of an ongoing theme already. Um, and I know just from my dissertation work and not from my work at Pew that there is a lot going on at the state level. And states like Washington and Oregon are already requiring evaluation of their tax expenditures. And, you know, I don't think there's an ideal yet, but certainly uh, other states and the federal government could look to them, for examples. Um, there's a, like a 10-year uh, performance process going on in Washington, and there's some really interesting things going on there. So. Um, as to the last question that was um, stated by um, uh, you, Mr. Schumann, um, Mr. Beach, you said that um, people incorrectly think that eliminating these expenditures will increase taxes. I don't really see how that would be incorrect. Um, these expenditures ins ensure that certain people aren't paying certain money in taxes, and eliminating these, exp these expenditures will cause these people to then pay this money. Wouldn't that be increasing the taxes that they pay? Right. Uh, if you... Uh if you work it out in an Excel spreadsheet, <coughs> you know, it, it undoubtedly would be the case that if you eliminate the expenditure, the tax base for that individual will, will expand, and hitting them with the same tax rate will increase the revenues that you get from that in individual. But uh, as in all things, the Excel spreadsheets don't uh, account for the behavioral response of the individual. Uh, they may find a way to sh shelter that income. They may, be, they may change their hours. They may... Uh, they may uh, shop around in the case of health insurance for a, for a catastrophic as opposed to a comprehensive insurance uh, uh, deal. They may move to a home that, that over time uh, presents them with less uh, tax liabilities because we're taxing the, the mortgage interest. So, so the idea that we can simply take whatever we have now in our estimates of a tax expenditure and then uh, assume that that will be the revenues that we'll receive might apply to minor ones where behavior doesn't affect but it, on, the, on the major ones, uh, behavior is going to be a, a major element to determining how much revenue we get from an activity. Um, obviously, no country has an ideal or seamless tax code. Do we know if there are any other countries that think about tax expenditures the way that we do? And if so, do they report them the way that we do? Or do they do better or worse? Um, actually, there has been some work on that subject in, in many other countries in the world, as well as some states. I don't know much about states, but many other countries in the world do have tax expenditure budgets. Uh, Canada does, Australia does, the UK, Belgium. You know, almost, almost every country in the OECD has a tax expenditure budget. Uh, uh, they have very different philosophies in, in how they, they look at tax expenditures. They divide between those who look at like like we do, that all ex all uh, exceptions to a particular income tax structure is a tax expenditure, and there are others that focus more on on spending uh, substitutes uh, in a, in a narrower definition of tax expenditures. But I think just about everybody does it, and I think the conclusion from the literature is that in no place has it been particularly effective. But. <laughs> I mean, there's it's been some there. bright spots. I mean, the UK got rid of the mortgage interest deduction in 2000. So, uh, oh well, countries have yeah, have yeah, re have reformed their code. Some, other yeah, other some, you know. some big ones. Too, yeah. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, just to build on that, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and OECD um, stipulated as a sort of requirement for fiscal transparency that countries would report tax expenditures. So it is very much sort of a standard that's out there. So if we ever. Uh, if the U.S. ever goes bankrupt, then perhaps if we need a bailout, then we might. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's not that funny, is it? It's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the gentleman in the second row. My question. <clears throat> so, um, the Tax Equity and Middle Class Fairness Act of 2011, how would that compare, Jesse, to your um, 
your boss's um, proposed legislation and do <coughs> can the panel comment on uh, I suppose the um, opportunity to pass one of these legislations in, in this year or the next year um, I, I guess I'd, I'd have to see the bill uh, in front of me to compare them um, I, I'm happy to talk afterwards if you'd like and I, I can give you uh, more information uh, as far as the likelihood of any of these passing um, I, I mean I, I think that's a uh, good question, and I, I just really couldn't say either. I, I think that maybe some of the smaller pieces um, of them could have a chance. It's all a question of how the budget debate uh, proceeds. So, so um, let's separate out the question of reforming the tax code uh, or parts of the tax code from making it more transparent. Um, we've seen uh, just today, actually, uh, pr uh, uh, Chairman Issa for the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform introduced a major piece of legislation uh, that would make contracts and grants more transparent. And uh, President Obama issued an executive order that's also aimed uh, sort of at the same aspect, sort of aimed, it's, it's aimed at uh, better access, better formats, what you were talking about, Ori, uh, to, to look at the data that's available so that people can sort of compare and figure out what's going on. Um, so I, I think I'd like to ask the panel uh, as well, given these developments, um, you know, in separating out again the idea of, of reform from uh, reform of, of how money is being spent to, ref to making these things more transparent, there seems to be movement on both sides of the aisle, on, on, uh, both in the House and the Senate and uh, from the executive branch to do something along these lines. But we've also seen efforts in the past, right? We saw uh, GIPRA. Uh, and what came from that, which was an attempt to, to make this uh, more transparent and, and from what you were telling me before, and I don't want to, it seemed like that wasn't all that successful. So, you know, are there other comments that you all have or, or points that are worth considering as, as we think about how to make this more transparent or is it going to rely on efforts uh, like that at subsidy scope to try to, take, to cobble together the um, the badly formatted, unaligned uh, data, you know, uh, sort of mismatched information that we have now and try to put that together. Uh, but that's a sort of like poorly formed question, but I hope you see where I'm going. So. Well, I, I certainly think it's a good idea on, uh, you know, and this, this effort of making that information more available. I, I, I just wish the administration, JCT, had thought about this a long time ago and put things in, uh, you know, way back when, when we only had Lotus, uh, but put it in spreadsheets so we could actually, uh, people could do something uh, with it. Um, but I, I think you can only, that uh, an outside organization can only go so far. I think that if uh, you know, good, you're gonna have to get somebody who, you know, uh, uh, some organization that is you know, clearly nonpartisan and is definitely thought that way and trusted by people to, uh, you know, do, I think, in-depth evaluation. You know, I mean, I'd argue I'd like to see a good cost-benefit analysis that includes, uh, you know, the costs, the benefits, uh, and the distributional effects of, of each one of these. Uh, the question is, you know, who is, is there a group out there that, you know, everybody, you know, people on both sides of the aisle would trust? And I'd say, you know, we do have some good congressional organizations that I, I think uh, meet that since they've been working for Congress for, for many years. Uh, you know, I guess the administration would probably want their own analyses uh, for their purposes. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, where we would eventually have to go would be you know, some congressional agency doing something and, and probably the administration would want to do you know, their own uh, an analyses since there seems to be a, a lack of trust between the administration and Congress. I'm, uh, I'm told, uh, because I'm not a Ways and Means staffer, I can have an opinion about the Ways and Means. Uh, I, I'm told that there's quite a few business groups who are busy right now trying to convince uh, Chairman Camp that even though we don't have an uh, uh, expiration of all of the extenders right, right away, it would be a really good thing to, to get them extended. Um, again, and um, so doesn't that provide us an opportunity for doing things on transparency? I doubt that Ways and Means is going to pass much in tax legislation this year, this year uh, but they may do an extenders bill. Well, that's something of value for people. So maybe this year it should be different. Maybe this year it should have uh, 
it should have a lot of language in it about being transparent about what, what you're getting, what are you doing for this, what's the factual cost-benefit analysis. I mean, that's an opportunity. And I think it's, it, uh, both Republicans and Democrats could come together on, on that. Um, nobody likes the bill. It, ha it happens every, every year it should, and it's always been, been, the, been the same. So let's use it as a vehicle for bringing about some, some change. I think next year, in 2012, we will see a tax bill, but not this year. Uh, a couple of comments. I think you can think of transparency at a lot of different different levels, and uh, you know, one is you know the analogy to contracts given out, which is kind of the individual taxpayer, and there the the problem is um, 6103, which basically makes taxpayer information confidential, and and so that that, that data for for good reasons, for good public policy reasons, just not going to become available. Um, in, in a lot of cases, so um, so some of that just can't be done. Now, for the well, for ask, the what if they do it in like the census model, where you do aggregate information and not individuals? Would that would that get around that problem? Oh yeah, no. I uh, if you but then then you're not asking you know which which firms or which mm -hmm. which companies. Are. If you're if you're looking at that level of information, you're not going to get it. If you're looking at aggregate information or sort of evaluative and. There are a lot of, I'll, I'll use an example at the other extreme, which is the, the charitable deduction. Uh, there's lots of data that's published in the public use file of who claims the charitable deduction by income class. Uh, we know something from other sources about where uh, deductions go, uh, contributions go from people at different income levels, uh, what kinds of things they give to. So it's possible to put together an awful lot of, of, of information on that. Now, for evaluative purposes, what you want to know, uh, of course, is how, or one thing you want to know is how much giving would be different if you change the tax law, if you didn't have the tax preference. Uh, sometimes I think half the economics PhDs written in the last 30 years in public finance has been somebody studying that question, and we've got answers like all, all, all over the lot. So, uh, and there are some mega studies which, which compile all these different estimates and how, how big they are. And then you can even go to one, one further level, which says, well, okay, suppose people do uh, give more to charity and, and, and uh, it costs the government X. Well, what are the charities doing with that money? And, and, and how effective is what they're doing? And are we giving 501c3 status to the right organizations? And, and is that the right way to spend public money? So I, I guess when you get right down to it, you can get an awful lot of information, but evaluation is hard because it's very subjective and it, it depends on the, on the eye of the, the beholder. I don't think it's any different for a lot of spending programs either, but I don't, I don't think we're going to just push a magic. It's good to get more information and more studies. I'm in the business of doing that, so I'm, I'm happy to see people say we should do more of it, but, but I don't know that we're, we're kind of getting some answer where a light will go on and, and, and somebody will say, well, we have objectively determined that Congress should keep the charitable deduction or expand it or get rid of it. I, I just don't think you're going to get, get that kind of information. So are there any final questions from the audience? Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Totter or maybe Dr. Beach as well. Um, a lot of the uh, reform plans that are out there right now, uh, the, the Rivlin plan and uh, in the, the, the Saving the American Dream plan, uh, the Fiscal Commission's plan. Uh, they reform the individual side and the corporate side together. Correct. Um, but the administration seems to be working on a plan that will only reform the corporate side. Um, so, you know, uh, get rid of the tax uh, expenditures and, and lower the rates, uh, but keep the individual side intact. Um, what is, uh, is that good public policy? Because um, many small businesses that operate as, as pass-through entities they file taxes at, uh, on the individual side of the ledger. So um, could you just comment on, on whether that's a good idea or, or not? What's the impact? Well, uh, I find it kind of intellectually incoherent to talk about reforming the corporate income tax without saying something about the in individual income tax. You, you mentioned one aspect of that. If you broaden the base, pass-throughs will be affected as well. If you lower the rates, that's going to make the top corporate rate different than the top individual rate, and that may have some consequences. But however, and, and of course, corporate income is taxed at the shareholder level, it's taxed at the corporate level. 
the incidence of each piece of it might be very different. So I, I really don't think it makes sense to fence off the corporate reform. I mean, the, the, the reason we have a corporate tax in the first place, logically, is to keep individuals from accruing money uh, tax-free within corporations. It's part of the backstop of the whole system of taxing income of individuals. So uh, it just doesn't strike me as, as making sense to kind of um, lay out the corporate tax as a, as a totally separate thing to look at without looking at the rest of the system. Well, I certainly want to agree with that. Uh, I guess uh, it's good to think about how Ron Wyden approached the whole business of tax reform over the years. Here's a, here, here's a person who uh, really started off with, uh, I would think, a, you know, a, a good intention, but not a lot of depth in the tax area. But he studied and studied and studied, worked on this, worked on this uh, year after year, has become the leading expert, I think, in the Democrats for how to, to do a nice, a nice tax plan. And his, in his Wyden Greg bill uh, was a very fine, is is a very fine tax bill. We did, we we worked a lot on that bill. Um, you have to have a comprehensive view of where you, where you want to want to go, and that, that goes to tax expenditures. You can't just approach one or two or three. You, you, you can't just pick and choose. You need, to know, you need to know where you're headed with your tax code and then watch what you're going to do on the spending side. You need to have a plan in order to get through the, 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 the mess that is our current tax code. And, and as evidence of the fact that maybe you don't have a plan, that's when you would change the tax rate in corporations and, but leave the other tax rate on, on individuals higher. That, as Eric says, just makes no sense at all. So do we have any uh, final comments, Lori, Jesse, or Tom? Is there anything that you'd like to add? Okay. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you for coming as well. Uh, and also thank uh, Representatives Isa and Quigley uh, for co-chairing the Congressional Transparency Caucus. Uh, our next event will be in a month. I'll have more information up on the website. And thank you again for coming.